So we're going to be talking about uh, the strategy for enterprise integration and to facilitate uh, digital transformation. So I'm Sagar Bushbal. So we'll, we'll talk, this is the agenda for uh, next half an hour. Uh, we'll give you a brief overview about uh, who we are, uh, what we do as Macmillan Learning. Paul is from Ribbon Fish. Uh, they are our implementation partners, uh, did a lot of heavy lifting for us. What is important uh, when it comes to evaluating and selecting an uh, enterprise integration solution is one of the key items. Why it is critical to look at the modern integrations, different type of solutions you have, and uh, what are the challenges uh, you encounter when dealing with legacy at the same time. Reasons why uh, seamless integration is critical, uh, and how did we overcome those, and what was our uh, strategy behind that. And at the end of the day, uh, it is important to improve uh, the developer experience, user experience, customer experience, which is one of the tenets of the digital transformation. So Macmillan Learning, uh, we are leader in uh, educational publishing uh, and ed tech. Uh, a lot of uh, solutions which we offer are around uh, LMS, uh, late night labs, uh, homework solutions, along with the textbook material. Our target market size is almost 9,000 plus uh, colleges and universities in US and Canada, uh, coupled with 50,000 plus high schools. What makes us uh, unique or different is we have deep partnership with a lot of uh, world's best researchers, educators, administrators, and content is the king for us. That helps drive our business forward. Uh, most of our solutions, digital solutions uh, today, are helping uh, instructors as well as students to improve uh, the outcomes. Uh, there are very dismal rates of uh, people graduating from colleges especially, and our tools are helping now not only for students to learn, but at the same time provide feedback to instructors so that they can take proactive measures to help improve that. So, so Paul King, as, as Sarah introduced me, um, from Ribbonfish, uh, we specialize in offering services solutions to the media and publishing industry. Uh, we specialize in WSO2, Salesforce, AWS, Azure, anything which has a technical edge, but really kind of specializing that media and publishing sector. Uh, value propositions, audit consultancy, analysis design, project implementation, as much as you would imagine us to be doing. Project recovery is actually one of our specialists. When those developers run away because everything just got a little bit too tough, we parachute in and end up cleaning everything up. Managed services, we do actually put some of our uh, staff on site with some of our clients. I've been working with Saga now for about four years, yeah, between the UK and the US. Uh, just an example of some of our other publishing clients, Macmillan Learning, obviously, one of our primary clients. Uh, Macmillan Publishers, Spring and Nature, OUP for Oxford University Press and one of our new ones, uh, British Medical Journals, but that's just a selection. But we very much specialize in, in media and uh, our extreme knowledge of the publishing industry. As I said, I'm about 20 years of in and around publishing, so uh, it's one of my specialties. Thanks, Paul. So uh, what is important when you evaluate uh, and select an enterprise integration solution? So before I get into the details, how many of you are already utilizing WSO2? So there are some who are probably evaluating or looking at. So this, these slides will provide you some insights. So uh, a few years ago, uh, we started to look at how educational industry is evolving. And uh, it had been always a s slow starter, but uh, over a period of time, it has really caught up speed. So we needed a uh, strategy, a technology strategy, to facilitate digital transformation. The key uh, tenants which we wanted to uh, basically address were around how can we respond to the market needs quicker. Uh, a lot of innovation needs to be done in the educational field. We don't have a lot of digital solutions at this point of time uh, which can help students learn and uh, be effective. Uh, for example, when it comes to maths, just having a text is not good enough. How can they solve the mathematical problems using digital solutions is a key challenge for us. Uh, it's, it also applies when you are trying to study uh, biology and some of the details around that are also very difficult just if you are uh, using digital solutions today. Pictures don't help. How can you go inside a specific uh, 
organ or things like that. Chemics, chemistry also same problems. There are a lot of complex uh, solutions you create and uh, how can you have a seamless experience while you are studying and make it more uh, interactive from students' perspective. So we uh, decided to develop a technology strategy which will address the market needs. We can innovate rapidly. We also need to figure out a way to do uh, continuous delivery. Uh, one of the challenges we have is it's a seasonal business. Like uh, this is the peak time when we are delivering a lot of pro uh, products into or making enhancements to the uh, existing products. Schools are going to open in August. So that is the peak time when a lot of our solutions uh, are getting used. Then it is another spring time. So delivering continuous improvements is a key. We don't want to be disruptive because it's any changes to the core platform uh, might cause a lot of uh, repercussions uh, in terms of the user community. At the same time, as things are evolving, we wanted to uh, also ensure that we are able to execute faster than our competition with new product development. So that was uh, one of the key drivers. The way the organization was structured uh, was also an important tenant for us to consider. And what I mean by that is, even though we have a technology strategy, you cannot develop a technology strategy in isolation. Uh, you have to take into account your organizational structure and the culture in which it operates. So there was definitely a need to improve the culture within the organization uh, when we are working with the partners and vendors and so on and so forth. And also look at our organization structure, uh, to align our organization structure across the technology departments. And at the same time, we use large number of uh, solutions which integrate whether it is from content generation all the way to warehouse when we deliver products to like Amazons and Barnes and Noble and uh, other such vendors, or when it comes to interfacing with digital solutions. Some of the solutions we integrate are provided by third parties as well. And that's why it was very important uh, to pick a solution which will allow us to seamlessly integrate. So this slide probably is a kind version how and what mess we inherited uh, before we choose WSO2. And how we went about choosing WSO2, we'll explain in a minute. But there are a lot of uh, systems which are in interacting with each other. There is tremendous tight coupling. And it was just not easy to manage and maintain. And meeting digital transformation needs was just next to impossible. At the same time, there were a lot of challenges the way the systems were integrated. There was tight coupling, there was uh, FTP, somebody gets an email, and those type of things were happening in the ecosystem. So support was almost 80% of our effort, and then 20% was only going towards evolving the business. So just to reinforce, when you looked at the previous picture, it gives you an idea that why you need a very solid uh, integration solution. And uh, this is something which everybody is talking about, uh, irrespective of the business today, that it, every company is a technology company, no matter how big they are or how small they are. And uh, you're not developing all of your own software solutions, whether it is for integration or, or customer relationship management or interfacing with different vendors and partners. So how can you use the tools which are available in the marketplace, make them part of your ecosystem, and then build the integrations in such a way that you are able to spend most of your energies on the key business value or goals which you have. What we did, and Paul will talk a little bit more in detail, but uh, we took the diagram and uh, looked at the overall ecosystem and defined the target reference architecture. We wanted to make sure that we have a very solid uh, target reference architecture which we would like to accomplish in a, uh, in a given amount of time. Looking at the target reference architecture which was more business focused rather than a specific technology. So we evaluated uh, several products in marketplace. We looked at the capabilities. We created a matrix, uh, a small glimpse into the matrix is the next slide. But we looked at the product uh, platform capabilities, uh, the maturity of the product in marketplace, what type of 
agility it was providing to the developers. There are a lot of solutions which involve a lot of custom development, custom coding, and things like that. What type of production support we were getting, and uh, of course the costs were an important driver as well. Licensing costs, subscription, as well as implementation costs. Once we evaluated like almost eight to ten different products, we narrowed down to three of them, and uh, we took a one of the complex uh, use cases which we had in terms of integration and we performed a POC on top of it just to make sure that the decisions are sound enough. So we went through several of these uh, drivers or KPIs and then scored them against uh, each of the platform which we have shortlisted. So Salesforce Heroku, we have a significant Salesforce investment. Uh, a lot of systems interact with Salesforce. So that was one, a MuleSoft, and this ride is almost uh, two to three years old before we made a choice to go with WSO2. And the score essentially is uh, right there, which helped us make a choice with WSO2. It involved, uh, as I said before, the development costs, ability to get your market, uh, your products to market quickly, the type of support, and uh, more than support the willingness of the vendor to work closely with you to solve your business problems. So while we were defining our target reference architecture, uh, it was important to keep in mind all the integrations which we have and the challenges uh, it was uh, causing us in terms of legacy. So it, I don't know if anybody has heard Conway's law before uh, this was some software developer from like 1967 that's when he defined uh, that organizations usually produce designs uh, which define the structure of an organization so whatever software solutions you are coming you will be able to relate based on your experiences that they're very much uh, aligning to the organization structure we had similar problems uh, marketing team was having their own marketing solutions they were not taking into account a lot of other ecosystems, uh, what is uh, needed for sales. Uh, at the same time, content production was having their own, uh, warehouse had their own. So all those systems have evolved over time and they were very much fragmented. In the last four to five years, the trend shifted. A lot of homegrown solutions were transformed into either modern homegrown solutions or we procured software as services. Uh, some of them were very specific to publishing industry, and we went with like platform as a service. So it's managed service hosted by the vendor. They're doing some customizations on top of the solutions, but we had all these different solutions across the board. The key uh, decision we made uh, based on this uh, variety of solutions we have uh, that by as a de facto standard we want to go with APIs. So wherever possible we want to integrate using APIs. Uh, if there are any data processing needs uh, like content migrations, content publishing, you cannot do through APIs just given the sheer volume of it. So how do we do it uh, near real time but using some sort of uh, schedule jobs, on-demand jobs, and they need to be integrated in a centralized system. There were a lot of uh, other things like uh, vendors providing us files. So Amazon, let's say, is selling a ton of books for us. Uh, they provide, even Amazon, they provide us the report in an Excel file and they dump it on an FTP site, which we pick it up and then we process through our royalty systems and other systems. So there are a lot of such situations. Uh, when we get orders also from uh, vendors, depending on the demand, uh, they either send an email and things like that. We push that to an API framework and uh, since we cannot process many of the orders real time, they made into queues. We streamline that as well. And one of the outcomes of this uh, WSO2 platform utilization was to ensure that there was no more direct coupling. So th this diagram I am showing here, we had all of these type of connections. So a CRM system has a DB link, which is connecting to a warehouse system. Just because you are same company, you utilize that. 
Uh, there were a lot of SSIS jobs running when a student is enrolling, we want to provide that information into Salesforce back. And since we were able to have an SSIS connection between uh, the LMS platform into Salesforce, they were all very tightly coupled. Then the new systems uh, had APIs, so we are also having APIs and they were also directly hooking into one of the solutions. So how do we, uh, how do we basically transform this is to this. Th this is our current uh, architecture. So everything, especially Salesforce is on one side. Most of our marketing team now uses Salesforce along with other marketing solutions, whether to do email blasts or just to track emails, uh, qualifying leads and so on and so forth. But Salesforce is uh, more or less one of the key systems we have. ESB is sitting on top of it. And all the connections between uh, products uh, or platform integrations, uh, digital fulfillment, uh, anything happening with print fulfillment, with the warehouse, all are routed now through the WSO2 uh, integration services. So we use ESB and data services. A lot of internal applications we are also utilizing now identity, pro uh, identity solution from WSO2 so that all these tools can use a single, uh, single ID to interact with. So with that being said, Paul will take you through more into what was our strategy from architecture standpoint, what type of governance model we put in place, and we uh, uh, what is on our roadmap to for the rest of the year. Thank you, Saga. So just to continue where Saga's left off, uh, as you can see from that diagram, I'm sure it's something that everyone's seen or at least experienced at some point. Disparate systems everywhere, lots of different types of connections, no idea really what's going on. When you try to look at that from a kind of innovation kind of point of view, it's very, very difficult. As Saga said, you end up spending between 60 or 80% of the time actually supporting what's there rather than concentrating on the innovation moving forward. Uh, really need to quantify the strengths and weaknesses of all of those integrations. That generally at this point, I mean, when we put that diagram together, the kind of spider as I love to call it, uh, we had to do a big discovery and actually unearth what was FTP, what was SSIS, everything, all the connections underneath. One of the big things which we really took from it when we selected WSO2 as a, uh, as a platform, as a service, uh, was really that there are plenty of solutions within WSO2 themselves. We'll talk about it just a little bit more to, as we move through it, but really we're not reinventing the wheel here. Other people have already done what we're trying to do. WSO2 offer plenty of connectors for doing things simply. Let's not overcomplicate it. Uh, again, Saga's already kind of stressed this point, and we're going to keep drilling it home and drilling it home about defining that target reference architecture before you do any level of development. You need to look at what you've got, if that's a discovery process about really kind of understanding what integrations you do have, it kind of really does define what your target reference architecture is. If anyone was listening to the keynote yesterday when Tyler was talking, he kind of expressed about this kind of 10-year vision, 20-year vision, and it's kind of, that's the idea that you've got to take when you're defining your target reference architecture. You have to take steps then to develop the best practice. What are we going to do? You know, we're going to take all of our known integrations and we're going to overlay them to the capabilities of what WSC2 can do, but we have to make some decisions first. API de facto standard, that's what we're going to do. We're going to use APIs. On the caveat that we are still going to work with lots of legacy systems which aren't going to be capable of supporting APIs. So again, you need to look at what's available within WSA2, knowing that APIs aren't always available. Sal has already mentioned, no direct coupling. You know, we've always had those developers which would sit there and think, uh, you know what, I really can't be bothered to go through the whole kind of management chain and the governance. Uh, I know a backdoor into a database, so I'm just going to go and connect to that that's no longer going to happen. If you need to get data, it's going to be exposed to an API. If it doesn't support an ability for an API, then we're going to look at something else, XML, flat file transactions, but it's all going to flow through the bus. This is the important thing about really taking that mindset of what used to be and where we ended up with that horrible diagram of the spider to what we now have today, which is this really kind of nice streamlined integration. Uh, utilizing compliant SaaS services, AWS SQS is, is one of them. Macmillan Learning is an AWS house. All the infrastructure and everything is in AWS. So, yeah, Rabbit in queue, there's, there's loads of messaging services. Not saying that one's better than the other, but seeing as they're an AWS house, let's utilize the infrastructure which is already available. Mentoring team members about the plug and play components. I just mentioned connectors. 
you know, they are there. Don't go and reinvent the wheel. There's no point. Um, enterprise architect, key linchpin. It comes back to the defining the target reference architecture. You know, for, for an enterprise architect to have that vision and look between two years, three years, five, 10, 20, you know, I'm not saying that that target reference architecture isn't going to change or evolve because it will over the next 20 years, but really that enterprise architect having that vision and seeing what is possible is absolutely key to a successful implementation. Uh, utilizing out of the box capabilities. Um, this is kind of one of my favorite points actually, avoiding customization. I watched a really good session here yesterday, another customer story which is about the uh, nightmare on SSO Street. Uh, and, and the pain and hassle that they went through with too much customization meant continued failure. It makes your releases, your upgrade paths, you know, we can't rerun 4.9, but if we have a ton of upgrades in there, it's gonna cause this difficulty going to five or enterprise integrator, one of the two. Um, I th yeah, I'm not saying that you can't make customizations, but you can actually be more tactical about how you make your customizations. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and just talk about support in some respects. There were some hands of using WSO2 here. Raise your hands. Yes, yeah. Contacted support before? Yep. And so you're not talking to someone that's sat there with a sheet and they are reading through just a, a list of the common questions. What you're actually talking to is actually a developer at the other end. So when our developers come across a problem, so we need to make some customizations. In discussions with Saga, we're not actually going to make those customizations. What we're going to do is actually dig in and see what the problem was. We go back to WSA2 saying, we found a problem with your, one of your connectors. Here are your options of what you could do. Here's option one, here's option two, here's option three. Uh, WSA2 actually implemented all three of our options and it became part of the product, part of the connector, which is brilliant. So we worked with the client, made sure that they're happy. Implementation partners work with the vendor, happy relationship. And so if it ever changes and we do want to upgrade, we're not compromising our, our, our implementation. So you could be more tactical about making customizations. Don't go off wildly creating too many things. You will head to disaster in the future. I'm not saying you will, but you might make your life easier. Um, how did we achieve our seamless integration? What was the key? Documenting everything we knew about all the integrations before deciding on that target reference architecture. Again, I'm saying target reference architecture, can't stress it enough. But really, I mean, we started the process of really looking at all the integrations that Macmillan had when we built that spider. I'm going back to 2014 when we started first digging through everything. Um, it was an exhaustive process, but needed to happen. You know, people join a company, implement something, leave the company. Somebody actually does something that you have no idea which is happening. All those DB links, uh, so you, you have to really gonna unearth everything before you can define that target reference architecture. Once you know what you have, it's all about mapping those, those integrations to processes and the capabilities of what WSA2 has. You know, we're not talking about development yet, we're talking about flowing these out, making sure that everything we want to do is, is, is capable within WSO2, which thankfully everything is. Um, but it's, it's planning it just a little bit more strategically, not just going, right, I'll start development because, again, you're going to hit a roadblock somewhere down the line. Uh, standardization again, FTP, everybody still uses FTP, it's not going to go anywhere, but I don't want to use 96 FTP servers, I want to use one with 96 folders. Um, so centralizing uh, more of your technology stack. Decommissioning, uh, queuing solutions already said about there's nothing wrong with RMQ. SQS is, uh, for Amazon is what Macmillan wants to use. So again, I'm not having an argument saying that one's better than the other. I'm just saying that we're making a decision to standardize that. We're gonna use one particular queuing system. Then you don't have your operations guy which is trying to support two different types of technology or more types of technology. Uh, utilizing the connectors, also a key. We use many of them. We've got AWS, SQS, file processing, we use the file connector. Uh, Salesforce, we're actually just uh, playing around with a PagerDuty connector at the moment. Uh, again, Saga sort of touched on it with email, ticketing-based integration, that everything happens automated. If a salesperson has sampled out a book to one of the instructors to try and secure an opportunity so that they can drive a revenue stream, you don't want that, that sales rep having to check Salesforce to make sure that something happened. No, that's all automated, and that's the key of the ESB. Uh, scheduled jobs as well, when we looked at the spider, there were scheduled jobs absolutely everywhere. Now everything is kind of consolidated and controlled uh, in one central place, and that is actually within the ESB. 
Um, this last point, I, I, I think, is actually really, really important. Uh, retrospective reviews. I mean, we, we hold a weekly kind of review of new innovation or looking back on what we've already implemented. At the beginning of 2017, we started uh, getting in contact with WSA2 again to look at a re retrospective kind of validation review of what we'd actually implemented. Um, yeah, money really, really well spent. We had Dushan, he's actually in the oxygen bar. He's a real stand-up guy, really knows what he's talking about. Um, he actually came on site for a week and in conjunction with client, partner, vendor, we kind of went through everything which we'd actually put in together as our target reference architecture. We actually ended up making a significant change. We'd had some stability issues, but you know, working with the vendor, working with the implementation partner and the client, you know, we've removed one of those significant instabilities. And I will touch wood when I, when I say it, but we, we haven't actually had an outage since uh, five weeks. Uh, since we finished implementing the recommendations that came out of that review with, with Dushan and WSO2. So really, really important, and I can't stress enough, to continuously always look back at what you've done. And you know, you're not gonna get it right first time. It might be a really good solution, it might be a really good idea, but it might, not, might just not work properly or cause you problems further down the line. So always go back and look at what you've done. Um, a little bit about approving the developer and customer user experience, how we get things out at speed. So everybody's heard of playbooks, whether you've worked in support or whether you've worked in development. There's always a manual of some sort to, to help you along your way. Uh, achieving business goals, actually really important. So Macmillan is now, Macmillan Learning is actually transforming at quite a rate. Saga's vision of what's been, actually been implemented and in conjunction with the WSO2 ESB, yeah, a lot more of our digital capabilities. We have lots of digital platforms. We can now integrate with those at speed. So for example, over the last six weeks, we've actually been integrating three new uh, digital platforms which were within at Macmillan, but we already, we'd already done it once. We had a playbook for that. It might not be the same developer which is coming back, but you can follow the, the, the roadmap and the pattern of one integration and allay that to another. Uh, managing uh, dependencies effectively. Sargat's already spoken about this a little bit, but you know, we don't work in isolations. There's lots and lots of different engineering teams. We need to work with those. The ESB is now a linchpin kind of holding everything together. We can't do something in isolation, neither can the engineering team, neither can the Salesforce team. We'll have to talk together, and that's about managing those dependencies effectively with design reviews, regular meetings, or just being aware with a, a kind of combined roadmap. Um, optimizing maintenance and support. Yes, maintenance support is actually really, really important. Uh, it's fine to put something in, but you remember you've got to look after it. You've got your ops guys. It's not going to be your developers which are supporting the WSO2 platform. That's your operations guys. Making sure you have playbooks for those is actually really, really key. So they know if they need to go and restart a node, they're not left hanging in the wind. They actually know how to go and log on to the environment. They know how to go and restart things. Um, improving customer satisfaction, you know, when I say customer, that could be an external customer, that could be an instructor, that could be a student purchasing something from the e-commerce store. Saga's a customer, uh, I could potentially be a customer, you know, it could be somebody that's checking something in Salesforce for someone that's self-sampled something from one of the uh, public-facing websites. It's all this digital transformation to enable us to improve their journey or improve people that work within the business to do their jobs more effectively. Um, Again, sustaining demands of business transformation. Just because we've got to this first hurdle now, it's not over just yet. You know, we've got a whole backlog of things planned for the rest of this year, and even stretching into 2019 of innovation, which is being driven through the ESB. So it's still there, it's gonna continue, and it's moving, it's moving. Um, additional solutions for monitoring, scalability, reporting, all really key and important. I'm gonna to touch on those in just a second, if I can skip. Um, they kind of tie together those last two statements, but there's a, there's a key about we're, we're all subject matter experts. Sorry for tapping the mic. Uh, all subject matter experts, um, but are we looking at the right things all the time? We need to look at some of the data which is available to within the ESB itself, because when we start looking at monitoring, supporting, you know, there's a little mention down here about pager duty. Now, if I'm, we're just trying to work through an implementation of pager duty at the moment, but if I go and take one of the APIs, which is perhaps used, I don't know, twice a year, twice a month, uh, and decide to, to base our proof of concept that that's the most important API, it's not. We need to look at the data which is available to us and using the, the capability of the ESB, so that then we go and target our most important um, uh, APIs. 
Uh, we've implemented New Relic, uh, Montis, Logly, um, all, all different tools and capabilities for monitoring whether are we running out of memory, what's our CPU doing, um, what, what's actually going on with the logs. We're actually working on something now about exporting um, custom logs just so that we can track details very, very specifically about operations that happen within the, within the ESB. I'm not talking about the payloads for such, but some of those business sequences that we run through. We do a lot of flat file processing. I want to know when that file starts. I want to know when we you know, started processing it. Did we hit any level of error in between? So this is kind of like what comes after your initial implementation about making it even better, about being able to report convincing Saga that everything is running hunky-dory. Um, customer or customer services not reporting application um, availability. We don't want them to do that. We want to be proactive. This is, the, yeah, I mentioned PagerDD. This is about us implementing things where we can be proactive. We can find out before the customer uh, even has to ring a support desk to say, I'm trying to order something from the e-commerce, but I can't. Um, so it's re really, really, really important, really important. Just to say as well, PagerDuty, again, that is a connector from WSO2. It's not something that we're writing ourselves. Um, we kind of touched run books, uh, but developers and support staff, having those run books, enabling them to do their job so that when PagerDuty does tell somebody to go and do something, everybody needs to know what to do. Um, we'll give ourselves a pat on the back for technology teams uh, proactively uh, working together and yielding that high availability. You know, I think we had an instance uh, just around two weeks ago where there was an issue with a particular digital service. So there was three engineering teams as well as the ESB team which worked together just to track where the problem was. Now, in past, I think this is one of the things which Saga's really kind of driven with part of this digital transformation about all of those teams knowing who everybody is and who to call, who to speak to. So we all get on a call. 15 minutes, we've solved it. Whereas what would happen in the past, a ticket would be raised, it would bounce from one theme to another to another. So digital transformation is also that whole mindset about how you're gonna work with everybody else. Uh, high availability, quickly delivery time, you know, We've integrated three new digital platforms in the last six weeks, which would have been an impossibility if we go back and look at that spider diagram. Um, so what else do we have on the roadmap? We, we, we actually have a whole backlog of innovation, which I've sort of touched on and mentioned, but that's not really about what I'm going to talk about here. This is about what we're trying to do to further improve the platform which we've actually implemented. Um, we're actually looking at Jenkins. Uh, I think the last guy that was on was mentioned about his automated deployment. We're not at a stage of automated deployment, uh, but we are moving to, to that fashion. Uh, for us, it will be Jenkins, because there's already a Jenkins implementation with the Macmillan. Um, Docker, you know, we, we were playing around with this uh, two weeks ago. Yeah, in 90 seconds, we could spin up an ESB environment. I'm not saying that ESB environment will work at the moment, but it's just something we're looking at and something which we'll try to implement towards the end of the year. Uh, we think we're actually doing a cracking job about how we've actually adapted and how we've changed with this whole digital transformation, which we're going to try and uh, impress onto other teams and move forward in that fashion. You know, I'm not saying we're doing it 100% right, but we've certainly got a model at the moment which I think will work for everybody else within uh, the middle of learning. Uh, again, stressing, review, review, review. Retrospectively, um, we found it incredibly useful, even engaging WSO2, but from weekly sessions about really challenging ourselves and probing ourselves again that, did we make the right decision? Can we do this better? And if we do it better, what's the customer satisfaction? What's the improvement? Um, uh, yeah, this is actually a really good point, actually. Analyzing customer support, yeah. We may think everything is absolutely brilliant, but we need to listen to the people within the business as well. Those, those customer service agents which might be talking to a disgruntled student, a disgruntled instructor, because they were trying to do something. We need to listen to them so that we can make our processes and that whole digital transformation just a lot more splendid. Um, I think that's a thank you from me. Saga? Yeah. So if you have any questions... We have tried to compress a lot of things which we did in the last two, two and a half years in 30 minutes. Yeah, that was the question, how much time it took, two and a half years? Uh, this, we started in early 2016. Okay. And uh, the first, so while Paul was mentioning about uh, target reference architecture, I also wanted to make sure that it was not a waterfall way of executing the project. We did have an agile practice, and that's the uh, model we used for all the 
entire execution. So, roughly two years. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Any more questions? Phew. Either we did a good job or terrible. <laughs> <laughs> No questions, then thank you. Thank you very much.